Hello, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and today we're going to be spending a couple of minutes together talking about embolization for renal trauma. Most renal injuries are caused by blunt abdominal trauma. This accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of renal injuries. It's usually due to motor vehicle trauma, but some can be caused by a direct blow, skiing accidents, or a fall from height. Injury is likely due to either rapid acceleration or deceleration. Rapid deceleration produces tension on the renal pedicle from relative forward motion of the kidney against a fixed hilum. This can lead to vascular laceration, thrombosis, or disruption of the UPJ. Rapid acceleration produces injury when the kidneys collide with adjacent, posteriorly located bony structures like the ribs and the spine. Penetrating trauma can account for the remaining 10 to 20 percent of renal injuries. This includes stab wounds and gunshot wounds, but can also include iatrogenic trauma. After biopsy, there's about a 7 all the way to 60 percent incidence of post-renal biopsy bleeding, and bleeding can also be seen after a nephrostomy or after nephrolithotomy. When obtaining a history from a trauma patient undergoing this type of injury, you want to make sure that you outline the details of the event that caused the injury. It's important to understand the mechanism of injury and the forces involved, because in cases of high deceleration or acceleration forces, there is a high risk of renal injury, and this would prompt performance of further imaging. You also want to know about pre-existing kidney abnormalities because this, this can put a patient at risk for renal injury even from a low impact mechanism. Physical exam could help determine the location, extent, and severity of injury. You want to look for penetrating entry and exit wounds, abdominal peritoneal signs, and signs that may indicate renal trauma, such as a large flank or upper abdominal hematoma, a palpable mass, ecchymosis, or rib fractures. You also want to know if they're experiencing visible hematuria, but know that that's only present in one-third to two-thirds of patients who have experienced renal trauma. 50% of patients with grade 2 renal trauma and 30% of patients with grade 4 renal injuries have no hematuria at presentation. Labs are usually obtained. A urinalysis is good for assessing microscopic hematuria. You obviously want to get a crit to assess for blood loss and a creatinine to assess renal function. Grading of the injury is important in renal trauma because this can reflect severity, it could guide management, and it can aid in prognosis. And understanding the AAST scales are important so that we speak the same language as other patients caring for the trauma patient. In the event of renal trauma, there are five grades that are used. A grade one injury is a contusion or non-expanding subcapsular hematoma without a laceration. A grade two injury is a non-expanding perirenal hematoma and or a cortical laceration less than one centimeter deep without urinary extravasation. A grade three injury is a cortical laceration greater than one centimeter deep, but again without urinary extravasation. A grade four injury is a laceration through the cortical medullary junction into the collecting system, or it's a segmental renal artery or vein injury with a contained hematoma or a partial vessel laceration or vessel thrombosis. And a grade five injury is a shattered kidney or avulsion of the renal pedicle. CT is usually first-line imaging in the setting of trauma. It helps determine the grade of renal injury, which will help determine if non-operative management is appropriate for a stable patient. It can reveal vascular abnormalities such as a contrast blush or extravasation, a pseudoaneurysm, or an AV fistula. It may detect other abnormalities that may warrant a laparotomy, and it certainly can serve as a baseline study for follow-up imaging. On CT, contrast extravasation and a perinephric hematoma rim distance greater than 3.5 centimeters are predictors of intervention. The rim distance is the distance from the renal capsule to the rim of the hematoma. Conversely, angiography is not likely to be required in patients who didn't demonstrate intravascular extravasation and those who had a perirenal hematoma rim distance less than 2.5 centimeters.
I did just want to include some examples of what the different grade injuries look like on CT. Here's a grade 1 injury. Here's a grade 2 injury. Here's a grade 3 injury involving the left kidney. These images are from a grade 4 injury involving the right kidney. And these images are from a shattered kidney or a grade 5 injury of the right kidney. Historically, hemodynamically unstable patients were taken to the operating room for operative management. Today, non-operative management is preferred in most patients, even those with high-grade renal injuries. Therefore, nephrectomy rates are decreasing. And this was confirmed in this study by Lee in 2017, who looked at renal interventions before 2009 and after 2010. And the management of renal trauma clearly has changed. While the number of observation cases is similar, embolization seems to be replacing operative management in these patients. The indications for surgery include life-threatening hemorrhage in hemodynamically unstable patients. Patients with severe vascular injuries, including avulsion of the renal pedicle or renal vein injury, without self-limited bleeding can also be considered for surgery. And finally, patients with penetrating trauma and the presence of associated abdominal injuries may also lead to surgery in higher rates of nephrectomy. The reason why attempts are being made to avoid surgery is because patients with renal trauma are at high risk for nephrectomy, regardless of the operative intent. This risk can be as high as 64%. The retroperitoneal location of the kidneys gives them an innate tamponade mechanism to control excessive bleeding and urinary extravasation. When these patients are taken to surgery, gerotis fascia is entered, and that means that the hematoma is no longer contained. This can lead to more bleeding and can then lead to a subsequent nephrectomy. And the risk and consequences of nephrectomy have prompted a trend towards non-operative management for renal trauma. Non-operative management is defined as observation of the patient with regular monitoring of vital signs, serial hemoglobin checks, follow-up imaging, and no renal-related interventions. Patients are usually on bed rest until clinical signs become stable and macroscopic hematuria has cleared. Non-operative management is currently the standard of care for low-grade renal trauma and is also recommended for most high-grade renal injuries when patients are hemodynamically stable. Unfortunately, 2.7% of patients managed non-operatively will fail and require either surgery, embolization, or nephrostomy within 24 hours of admission without a renal procedure. A high-grade injury and the presence of coexisting abdominal injuries may predict the failure of non-operative management. And secondary hemorrhage in patients with high-grade injury is usually the result of navy fistula or pseudoaneurysm that wasn't recognized on the initial CT. So let's talk about embolization. And the reason why we need to talk about embolization is that it plays an important role in renal trauma. This is an interesting algorithm that was published in 2019 in the World Journal of Emergency Surgery. And as you can see on the left side of this algorithm, patients with every single grade of renal injury can potentially um, be candidates for embolization based on the CT findings. We typically perform embolization in stable patients with non-self-limiting gross hematuria and or contrast extravasation, pseudoaneurysms, AV fistulas, or extended perirenal hematomas on CT. It is the first choice treatment in a stable patient with a solitary kidney and a grade 3 to 5 injury with contrast extravasation on CT. Angiography is going to show you several different manifestations of severe renal trauma. You can see an arteriovenous fistula, you can see a pseudoaneurysm, and you can even see gross extravasation of contrast. Technically, almost every embolic agent has been used successfully for renal artery embolization in the setting of trauma. It's important to be as selective as possible so that embolization is performed at or near the site of arterial injury. The use of microcatheter embolization in a superselective position reduces the extent of tissue infarction and will maximize the preservation of functioning renal tissue, which is always a concern that's at the top of our minds when treating a patient in the setting of renal trauma.
The good news about embolization is, is that the success rates are high. The overall success rate in blunt, in blunt trauma range from 63 to 100%. About 80 to 85% of patients with grade 4 and grade 5 injuries can avoid a nephrectomy when treated with embolization. Embolization seems to have better results in terms of renal function and ICU length of stay compared with nephrectomy. They do show similar transfusion rates and similar rebleeding rates. And finally, success rates are higher in centers with more embolization experience. Of course, this doesn't work in everybody, and some patients are going to require repeat procedures. A higher injury grade is associated with an increased likelihood of repeat procedures after an initial embolization. If a repeat embolization is required, then the success rates are similar to those seen in association with the initial embolization procedure. After embolization, there's no evidence for worsening of renal function. This includes patients with or without baseline renal insufficiency. Patients with pre-existing hypertension, however, may be at risk for worsening of their blood pressure. So blood pressure monitoring is recommended after renal trauma. In the event of an iatrogenic injury, technical success rates associated with embolization are still high. Um, a prolonged INR and a more proximal vascular injury, however, may predict failure of embolization in this setting. After biopsy, embolization can successfully address bleeding after renal biopsy. But if the initial angiogram during these procedures is negative, then lumbar or iliolumbar artery angiography should be considered because they may be potential sources of the bleeding. Embolization in this setting does not cause a worsening of renal function. So here's an example of a case. This is a picture of the kidney during the biopsy procedure. And this is what happened several hours later when the patient represented. You can see a large posterior perinephric hematoma. The angiogram demonstrated extravasation of contrast from a lower pole renal artery. Selective catheterization was possible, and we were able to use a microcatheter to get almost exactly at the site of arterial injury. And then small microcoils were used to embolize the two branches which were felt to be involved, and that allowed, allowed us to preserve as much functioning renal parenchyma as possible. Embolization can also be performed after nephrolithotomy. Um, embolization will be largely successful in these patients, but may fail in about 10% of patients. In addition, the use of gel foam alone increases the risk of treatment failure, so that agent is not advised in this setting. Here's a patient who underwent that procedure and was experiencing some bleeding, and you can see right by the Foley catheter that there is a pseudoaneurysm that likely explained the bleeding that the patient was experiencing. We were able to use a microcatheter to make our way all the, all the way out to the area of arterial injury, and then we used microcoils again to embolize this vessel. The important point here is to get as distal as you can because that will enable you to save as much kidney as is possible. Embolization is a safe procedure, but there are potential complications. These include non-target embolization of unaffected renal parenchyma, puncture site bleeding, arterial dissection and thrombosis, contrast-induced nephropathy, a renal abscess, and an iatrogenic pseudoaneurysm and AV fistula. After embolization, there can be a post-embolization syndrome, which is characterized by back pain and fever. And as we see with other indications for embolization, this is usually self-limited. After the procedure, bed rest is recommended until hematuria is light without the need for bladder irrigation. General discharge criteria include being afebrile, tolerating a normal diet, having adequate pain management, and demonstrating stable blood tests. There's no definite evidence with regard to the timing of return to normal activity after renal trauma. In general, bed rest or reduced activity is recommended until gross hematuria is resolved. Return to sports after minor or moderate renal injury may occur within two to six weeks, while severe injuries may require longer periods that can last as long as six to 12 months. As a general rule, sports activity should be avoided until microscopic hematuria is resolved.
Repeat imaging isn't necessary for patients with grades one to three injury as long as the patient's clinically stable. It is recommended for patients with grade four to five injuries because a urinary tract leak can be missed on the initial scan in about 1% of cases. In addition, blood pressure should be checked periodically after injury. Patients with grades four to five injuries are at the greatest risk for high blood pressure. In general, patients who are normotensive in the immediate post-trauma period usually don't develop signs of hypertension during follow-up. In conclusion, embolization is a safe and effective treatment for appropriately selected patients after significant renal trauma.